uh, sending out its energy, and the perimeter is propagating. And the perimeter propagating from one center becomes ultimately into the center of another. So this one here, its perimeter is pushing right out until it hits the center of others. And then mutual stimulation takes place. So they all feel, they're all aware of each other by the impulse and the pushback, by the pushing and the pushback. So that if this is just going through space, or aware of itself, where it comes against something else and feels the resistance, then it is it does have that reflection. It feels that force pushing against another force. And that's the concept as I understand it from what he's just described there. Okay? And consequently, because the geometry, I'm on to number four now, because the geometry of all spheres is identical, then any sentient being, any spherical sentient protoplasmic being in fact exact, has a, in fact exactly the same form as any other being and this being said of all beings all spherically originating beings have already seen all that there is to be seen because they be, they become serialized in the time before they become serialized in the time process of that sentence again so and this being said of all such beings all spherically originating beings have already seen all that there is to be seen before they become serialized in the time process. So that world is the eternal world before the time process, before, and the time process is a super stressing of any particular network of those to create individual forms. Now this is the bit I've got to try and get across now, to try and explain how an infinite field can contain all possibilities and also can have limited possibilities running through it in a time process. This is the idea that time is the moving finger of eternity. So it's eter eternity it contains all possible situations. Any particular situation has been separated out or super-stressed, as Eugene calls it in this particular lecture, super-stressed from all the possibles which are recorded in that infinite white paper. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Now, if we say that simultaneous presentation of form, absolutely, so all possible forms, infinite simultaneous presentation of form, absolutely, is eternity, and serialization of any group of those forms, or any form at all, serialized from that infinite possibility is time, then to become aware of this absolute sphere, is to become aware of all the formal possibilities that may be serialized in the time process. Okay? So what he's saying here is that to become aware of all that infinite, which is which we came out of, into the time process. So if we imagine a whole series of these things, only if we draw them tiny, imagine them as tiny little interlaced circles like this, we can create any form, any shape, whether it's a triangle of circles, we can emphasize a group and find triangles in it, we can find any shape, whatever we can draw the shape of a lion or a dog or a camel, a mountain, so that when, as the Buddhists say, you know, the, the pine top and the top of the mountain are exactly the same, they come from the same place, they're, in, they're the same size, they're talking about the fact that in eternity all forms are represented in that infinite space. Yes, you can separate them out. You can make any one of them enormous, tiny, whatever, impossibility. But in infinity, all things are the same. So when they say, what was your original face? Or when God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Then you're talking about what you were in that form. Everything was in that form, but you were in that form as well. You were in that infinite ocean of life before it started to serialize and you know the possibilities of serialization so you can see all the possibilities coming to terms in reality so that is the ground which he's going to describe as the ground of deja vu that you can actually do that and that it has a wonderful significance above and beyond the mechanical one and I would say perhaps even above and beyond what Tony's describing because that is useful and he uses that word useful because that can help you to get a grip on reality. Help you to get a grip on not just 
um, the infinite, of, you know, and getting into that in terms of meditation, but also understanding what you can do in life, what you can do in a situation when you can see and feel the possibility of what's going to happen next. And he talks about that in the terms of a yoga term called viragya. This is the yoga term. <clears throat> it's from Sanskrit. And it's usually described as a higher indifference. And he describes it, he breaks it, the and the. And he says you're affirming... Yeah, you're affirming the rage or the desire or the impulse and you're seeing it. So you're seeing it, the rage, the desire, nature and you're affirming it. So in other words, he's describing it as the higher indifference comes because you can see the end process of any activity you start. So you can see what the serialization is going to do with this particular situation that you're in or that is around you. So you're seeing how the desire is pushing the situation and how it is likely to develop. And because of that, you don't do something which you know is going to be destructive to you and other people. There's not a battle involved. You don't have to struggle with yourself to give up the extra cream cake. You can see what the process involved is, is doing. He uses the example of, it's not anything cleverer than someone who doesn't sit on a hot piece of metal because he knows it's hot and the damage it will do to him. So it's not a struggle. I won't really want to sit there, but I, I, you know, I, I mustn't, it's bad for me. It's quite a logical thing. You just don't do it because the damage incurred takes so much long, so much time to, to repair. So he describes it quite simply as that. It's called the higher indifference, but what it actually is, is seeing the end result of any, any activity that you put into practice. So you then start to realise that there are several things that it's not worth doing. Not in any holy or moral instance, but because of you know, the processes that will be incurred are inefficient. So it's higher indifference in that sense. It's not an indifference which comes from a lack of interest has been there and seen through the situation and seen to the end of the situation. This is um, <clears throat> quotation five. This is a kind of higher intelligence, but it really means when we cut the word up to affirm the desire or raging nature, nature the desire nature and to see its term, to see the end of it, see where it's going to. It says if you let go of the serial presentation and see the simultaneity of events, you will actually be able to see the way the way your rages or desireful impulses develop. You see the end result of anything you might do. And when you see it very, very clearly, then if the thing is no good, you just let go of it. You don't have to fight with yourself. You let go because it's just no good. And this state is related to the state called the higher indifference. Okay? So what he's saying is that his description of this infinite, which can be when you break the, the process of serialization is much more useful to you. It keeps you out of trouble. It stops you getting embroiled in things which, which just rob energy and which are blind blind alleys in love. Okay? Are we all following so far? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> These two kinds of inertias he then goes on to talk about inertia and that means that there is a push in the serial time process. He then describes a big circle. He's drawing a diagram, which we, are not, we haven't got a record of the diagram. And he's saying that the world is actually moving in one particular way, pushed by reality. So you can go with it, say, in a clockwise direction. Or you can also go anti-clockwise, if you can recognize what's going on. But the push is in a particular direction, and when you're in, to, in a situation, you feel the push, the drive, which the, the world is trying to bring about. Now, in human beings, because we have so many motivation written into us, there are two basic ones in people. Um, one is the improving perfectionist one, and the other one is the degenerating no-good concept. 